Hello, Josh. and welcome to Office Hours. <laughs> if you're new uh, and watching on YouTube, you can find out more about uh, what we do and engage with the community at our website at officehours.global. Um, we're very much embroiled in NAB, and we have a somewhat of a substitute cast here, but a lot of uh, very qualified panelists and technically capable to answer all of your technical media questions and production. We have a uh, second hour planned where we'll do sort of a round table of talking about the um, different NAB discussions. So stick around for our second hour. Andrew, Alexander, what do we have? Our first question this morning comes from Douglas Carmichael. Which aperture lights would you recommend for a home office setup? Go ahead, Ronnie. Well, they have uh, a lot of Ameren lights that uh, uh, will be um, uh, suitable. Um, I myself, I have the, a little bit older um, Lightstorm 60X uh, with soft boxes in front of them as uh, front lights. And uh, I have a lot of uh, small ALMCs in the back. But uh, to your question, um, I was looking at uh, some of the panels uh, which can easily be mounted on your desk, uh, angled towards you. They even have um, uh, panels that are... Um, color or bicolor that you can adjust so that you can hit the sweet spot of your camera. Um, and uh, of course, you can have those that are not bicolor as well and just go with uh, with the white balance settings that uh, those lights are, uh, are um, depending on. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, you don't say anything about budget, so it depends. Uh, they have... Uh, cheaper budget-friendly ones, and they have uh, more expensive ones. Um, so I think it depends a little bit. I would go for the panels with um, easy desk mounts. Guy. Yeah, currently I'm being lit by some IntelliTechs, um, but I did, I did get one of these uh, sister company to Aperture's the Amaran brand, and I did get one of these F22Xs. It, it, I have another uh, studio here, and that's my main light on that. These IntelliTechs are a little bit older, so I don't mind using them because I don't take these ones out in the field. That F22X, it, it's nice because it's versatile. You can use it um, in your studio. It's nice if you have um, low ceilings because you can get it up high and it's got a, a, a grid that comes with it. So it's easy to pack up, especially since they uh, improved the, yesterday they talked about it on the NAB show. They talked about um, the uh, ability to set it up fast. And so when the F22 first came out, it uh, was kind of a, a dumpster fire, but they sh they did the right thing and they shipped us out uh, a new piece that makes it super simple. But when you go out and you look at some of these uh, grip trucks, there's a lot of aperture out there. So it depends on what you want to do. But man, the light, when we had a showroom with some of the apertures up, uh, it was about a five or six foot softbox. If money's no object, that softbox, the look that you can get with a head to toe soft light is amazing. So uh, those are my two recommendations, F22 or the biggest softbox. I think it's called the 300 uh, and stick a, like a, a one of the aperture um, either... They've got a bunch of them. Um, the 150s or the 300s would do the trick. Multiples, yeah, that, that'd be the way to go. And for more um, tips, there is the studio tour that we did in Seattle where they had about 20 of those aperture lights lined across this whole entire ceiling. So you can get a, an idea as to what, what kind of look that you can get. Ronnie, want to get back in? Yeah, and um, you can also take an extra look at the type of uh, panel you would go for if you go for a panel. Some panels have uh, everything inside the panel itself, so not just Ameren. Ameren has external power supply, which makes the light itself very, very light and uh, easily, uh, easily to to or more easy um, adaptable to whatever rig you might have. So you can use smaller uh, stands or smaller um, uh, magic arms for that. Um, some of the panel lights have their power supply built in, uh, especially for the more professional type of uh, panels. And they are a bit more heavy and not easily uh, mounted in, in magic arms uh, stuff, uh, etc. So have a, have, a, uh, have a look at that as well. So weight is important. Courtney? Yeah, if I were, if Douglas, if I were you and going for the home studio where you may not have control over the ambient light color, color temperature, make sure you get the bicolor version so you can adjust it, balance it between uh, tungsten and daylight, uh, especially if it's going to change in your room. 
and uh, make sure you get the versions. I would get the panels because, you know, these big domes, uh, diffusers like a uh, guy was talking about, you know, they fold flat, but they take up a whole lot of room in your studio. Uh, that that thing can be about, uh, you know, 40 inches wide. So three or four feet of umbrella there to deal with. And you have to get it, you know, it takes up a fairly amount of depth with those like a D600 or one of the point source lamps attached at the back of it. Uh, it makes a very sweet diffusion, but panel lamp, it'd be a lot easier for you. Uh, and probably a lot cheaper. I think the D six hundreds around three grand, two grand, something like that per per instrument. So they're okay. a bit pricey. Yeah, and you're also paying a premium for that battery operation, as Ronnie was alluding to. Um, that F twenty two. One of the brilliant things about it is that I can just slap on one of my big uh, V mount batteries, and I can power that thing, and it, it'll run a long time because it's so efficient with LED. And then when you think about three point lighting, you know, I'm using two of those lights that we just talked about, the F twenty two style uh, light mats um, with grids, and those are my key and fill. And then behind me, I have a, a harder light, and that one's a um, that one's a Felix light. So don't just think about the Aperture brand just because we had them on yesterday or Nan Lux or any of those guys who I think we're going to be interviewing today. This is an Aperture light down here. Um, this is the controller. Uh, I don't know if you could see that, but basically this is all now controllable. Um, whoops. <laughs> well, there goes a different color. Uh, <laughs> you could do any color of the rainbow with the, with the P300 line. They have a bigger model called the P600. And now with the Sidus Link and the Sidus Link Pro app, you can actually do cues and things like that if you ever need to. So for folks that have different scenes like today, well, you just saw I was on kind of a minty green and now I'm on my standard daily uh, kind of a purple blue look. So it just depends on if you want that kind of look because without it, here's what it looks like. So you get the idea as to how boring uh, one of these backgrounds could look when you when you turn off that that color. So it depends on how how robust of a look that you want. If you want plain Jane, and sometimes I'll just make it the normal daylight color or the normal um, you know tungsten color, and that makes it look more like a house, kind of like what Bill's in with his hotel room right now with the practical. Yeah, you make a good point, guy. Um, we tend to be eclectic sometimes and pick up a light for this and a light for that, but it's, there's something to be said about uh, an ecosystem and having a lot of our setups on a single app uh, to be able to control things. Let's go to our next question. Next question is from Annie Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Would this new $99 external CF Express card interface for iPhone 15 work directly with the Blackmagic camera app? Jason? The Blackmagic camera app is really incredible. Um, the, the answer is yes. I mean, the Mix Pre 6 will work directly with the Blackmagic camera app. You, you can do ridiculous things with any class compliant app. So yes, 15 Pro Max will work. And yes, recording happens directly onto anything through the iPhone as long as it's a class compliant hub. Ronnie? If only there were some people in this uh, community that, for instance, worked at Zoom and could make the iPhone app uh, and uh, the iPad app uh, pos make it possible to choose what microphone you would like to use, that would be amazing. If if it's if it was up to me, I would try to get those functionality into Zoom. Next question. Next one's from Steve Yurov in Madison, Wisconsin. Looking for an external webcam slash mic combo to give uh, to users uh, doing Zoom meetings at client locations. Simplicity is more important than features, must be bus powered by laptop. Apple continuity camera is close, but Apple ID requirement is a problem. Go ahead, Ronnie. Well, there are two ways to look at this. Uh, it's the expensive way and it's the cheap way or budget friendly way. If I was to send out something to um, one of my guests, um, if if I understand the, the question correctly, I would send uh, this exact microphone, which is an MV7, um, and I would send uh, with them an uh, Insta360 Link camera. Um, those are the most user-friendly and uh, highest possible quality for the lowest possible price 
that you can get. So that's my uh, two cents. Alexander? Yeah, the MV7 is a pretty good sounding microphone. The one issue I have with it is the touch sensitive strip at the top, which I find it, it trips people up sometimes. So I still prefer XLR versions of microphones like the MV7X doesn't have the, uh, it's a little bit cheaper, doesn't have the USB interface. And I would get a separate audio interface. I really like the Lewitt Connect 6 as a great mixer app with onboard DSP processing. And uh, it also has a, uh, a loopback channel as well. So you can do mix minus on that as well. And of course, with the app as well, if you just handed somebody a laptop with, uh, with a VPN, I mean, you could log into the computer and remotely control it. If you needed to do that, you could do that. I mean, you could do that with any app as long as there's a way to control the actual interface from that computer. So usually that's what I go. And then the, the Insta 316 link that was said already, that's, uh, that's a great PTZ camera for a reasonable price. Yeah, Courtney. Uh, I agree. Um, the Insta360 Link, it uh, works well. It does have a microphone built into it or two microphones built into it. Although I tried to use it from uh, a remote and it, the, the mics in my laptop actually sounded a little better than the mics in that. They're okay in a pinch, but uh, it would be great for, it's great for your uh, camera because you can take control over, over Zoom and pan and tilt it to your device. Uh, own delight. If you have a cheaper microphone that's perhaps like uh, SM58 or a uh, dynamic or a condenser microphone, I just, you know, I got this pile converter. You know, we've talked about the Shure converters, which are very compact, but this is a USB converter from XLR and it, um, uh, it has a lot of nice features on it. It's only 30, uh, 35 or 44 dollars, depending upon whether it's on sale or not. Uh, so it's USB out, USB compliant, works cross-platform with Mac or PC. It is a USB interface. It has a headphone output on the bottom of it, and these knobs let you adjust your headphone levels so that you hear not only the microphone, you can dial in between the USB return, so the other side of your, of your uh, Zoom call, and the balance between your side tone from your current microphone that's plugged in here. And it also has its own mute button so that you press the mute button and it mutes the microphone uh, for you so you don't have to deal with the zoom mute so it has a hardware mute you can set this separately you could plug it into the end of the mic or you could plug it into a mic cable and have it on your desk separately where you could adjust the knobs and it's pretty cheap and pair it with any of the uh, our recommended two hundred dollars or one hundred dollars zoom you know uh uh, pile mics uh, would be a better choice than using the thing, using the mics built into the laptop and you'd get by pretty cheaply. Go ahead, Doug. So, hi, Steve. I got concerned when you said webcam mic combo, because for me, that immediately said that you were going to have one device that was going to act as both the camera and the microphone. And as people have been saying here, the problem is that the correct distance from you for a camera is often not the same as the correct or best distance from you from um, for a microphone. So if you've everything's in one circumstance, you're going to either have to get better sound by moving that whole unit closer, which means you need a real wide angle lens on it, or if your camera is at an appropriate distance, maybe three or four feet, the difference between the sound quality between a microphone placed three or four feet away and one like mine that's about four inches from my mouth is substantial. We talk a lot here about the inverse square principle and how sound kind of falls off over distance. If you move that mic away to the camera, then suddenly the room and any extraneous sound become a real problem. So just understand that most of the suggestions you're getting are about separating the microphone from the camera unit. And it really is always the best way to proceed if you can. And Guy? Yeah, I like the Insta360 link as well. And that's what I've been using. But I'm excited about a couple new models that have uh, come out. Uh, depending on your budget, there is the new Mevo by, um, um, I think it's Logitech that actually bought Mevo. Is that correct? I, I'm pretty sure that that's the case. But you'll need a lens. So it's a thousand bucks plus you'll need to get something like this 14 to 42, which will add another 347 bucks. And then for, for audio, uh, I like the little Sennheiser uh, USB-C microphone to clip on, but some people will forget that it's on. Otherwise, I like this little um, Shure MV7, get that on a little stand close up. And that, that's uh, if you have two USB-C ports, that takes up two USB. Actually, this one's a USB 
a so you, you don't or it's a micro usb but it comes with a a to a, a uh, cable so those two things should uh, give you a pretty good image but yeah i would probably on the cheap front insta 360 link just call it a day uh but there's also we'll talk about it a little bit later but uh <laughs> there's another camera that just it will be announced at the show that uh is pretty cool um maybe i can i'll pull up the image uh somebody pop a question and say uh what new micro four thirds uh ptz camera is uh coming out at nab <laughs> and i'll go pull up the image now we can order Cochrane's. go to, let's go to the next question next question is from douglas carmichael has anyone used obs's video capture device set to full range color as a workaround for the famous atem crush when streaming or recording alexander i've tried it haven't seen a difference uh, because as far as I know, the problem is with the hardware itself. Uh, the UB, the UVC, you, a webcam output on the ATEM, uh, does not send uncompressed video out. It is compressed MJPEG. There's nothing you can do about that. It's a problem with the hardware. So the way I, I work around it is to use an HDMI, a spare HDMI output on my ATEM Extreme which goes, uh, actually, I have that going into an HDMI matrix, so I can utilize it for other things. But that goes into a Roland UVC encoder. So uh, for under $200, you can get a Roland UVC one, which is HDMI in, USB 3.0 out, and that is fully uncompressed video. That will dramatically look better than what the ATEM is giving you. Also, if you're on Zoom, a few updates ago, they did do their own workaround for that. So you should notice in Zoom now, if you have the newer client, it should look a lot better. Ronnie Settle. Well, hello there. So um, Josh and I have played with this, and there's definitely a difference when you select limited color versus full color. There, uh, I don't know how perfect it is, and obviously it's not uncompressed like the, the Roland, which would be the ideal choice. But there's definitely a difference um, that we've seen with the Blacks uh, the crushed blacks on the uh, in OBS coming in to uh, from the ATEM with the full versus limited, and then of course Zoom has fixed the problem for us um, a little bit, and it looks so much better now with the ATEM going straight into Zoom. So they've given us a lot better color from that. Yeah, that that has been one of the workarounds that we have. Um, if you have an instance, one of the issues that we had with Zoom prior to them addressing is that there wasn't a way to select um, what color space that it was looking to to receive. So that has uh, seemed to to address the problem. The The only complication is that, you know, it just required a, you know, a pathing your video through something else to be able to interpret that something different than what the what the black magic was was sending. Next question. Next question is from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. What is new at the Magewell booth this year? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear the thing. Um, so, a few things. Let's see, where is it? There we go. So, a new firmware update for the Magewell director and really what it comes down to is full screen and um and instant replay so that's about that guy yeah in addition in that update to what uh, jason was talking about the director's just been a, a hit for a lot of reasons one of the reasons is it's an inexpensive srt encoder decoder uh, but it also does full ndi now so that firmware update gives it uh, full ndi whereas before it was just um NDI HX. One of the big bomb drops that uh, I saw yesterday as I was walking my dogs, I looked down at my phone because Major will put up an announcement uh, that they have now partnered up with uh, with Bolin. So Bolin and uh, Bird Dog are kind of in a legal battle right now. And so uh, no more uh, Bolin. So basically Bolin is doing the HDSDI and the uh, Dante enabled cameras. Uh, and they gave Bird Dog the the all the NDI. So basically, when you look at some of like the P200s, you'll notice that they say Bolin on the side, and that's because Bolin did the the motors and they did the the housing. So uh, because of their little squabble there with with some of the the X120 that was announced by Bird Dog, um, I don't want to get too much into the legal details. But basically, all the Bolin cameras are now going to be 
uh, handled by Magewell. And so that's that's an exciting announcement. Another thing that's in the booth is uh, the Mo- Motator, I believe is how you say it. Uh, They've got uh, these new encoders um, that basically allow you to put in different cards. So you can do NDI um, to um, HDMI, uh, SDI. Uh, so it looks like this. It's a 2U with uh, the ability to add in. It's kind of like open gear uh, uh, with, with some of the other vendors. So like Blackmagic has NAJ do open gear cards. So that is independent encoding and decoding with each module and Put the ones in that you want so you don't have to go out and get an AGA bridge for 15000 bucks. You can get one of these and mix and match to your heart's content. So that's what you can see in the booth at Majewell. Really cool. Next question. TJ Worrell in Minneapolis asks, after hyping Billy Joel's 100th at Madison Square Garden special for weeks, what was the network's decision to process? Uh, what was the network decision's process not to show the whole special? The broadcast ended mid-song at 10.30. Courtney? Well, I'd place an angry call to your local station because your CBS station cut it off because here in Los Angeles, we heard all two hours of it. It was a two hour and one minute broadcast. And of course, it's the tyranny of commercial television. They had to insert commercials into it. So the major networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC rarely devote more than two hours to any type of entertainment programming other than a live awards show. And this was not live because it was done... uh, I don't know, last month, and pre-taped and uh, prepared. It it uh, If it cut off at 10.30, that's probably your local station cutting in for news because they couldn't deal with the two-hour length uh, when they started it. So give them a call. It did play on the network full length of two hours and one minute. And Bill? You're muted, Bill. I'm sorry, you're going to have to unmute, Bill. My apologies. Without my mute button, I don't know what to do. I know for a fact that it wasn't live because last night, my wife, darn it, I'm in Las Vegas at NEB, got comp tickets to see Billy Jewel and Sting in a fabulous concert where I understand it poured rain on them part of the time. So (laughs) I'm just saying it definitely was a package thing. And you're going to find that all the time. the local needs, particularly with television, kind of, I won't say in decline, but there are fewer eyeballs going to television and more going to things like we do on the web constantly. So um, that ad revenue from the news part of an op- a local television operation is kind of absolutely mission critical to them. So it's not to me so very tremendously surprising that they might have cut away to add more dollars into their local account. Next question. We have one from our QR code here from Kane Trouble in Mildura, Australia. My work has me using new telehealth software, which does not detect my ATEM Extreme ISO USB UVC webcam. Only a virtual webcam workaround I generate from OBS, which I'd like to avoid. Any thoughts as to why ATEM working in Discord, Zoom, and VLC? Ronnie, can you help us out with that? Maybe or maybe not. Uh, I'll give it a shot. I see a couple of things you could test. Um, The one thing is that it could be your software is very depending on what frame rate your ATEM is delivering. So if the frame rates has changed uh, in the last days or weeks, you could try to change that over and maybe read the documentation in the software what it needs. Uh, other software like Zoom, etc., are more uh, acceptable for different types of frame rates. That's the one thing I would test. Um, another thing, if you're on a Mac, you don't doesn't say if you're on a Mac or Windows machine. Uh, if you're on a Mac, it could be security related. So it could be that uh, this software and this uh, um, UVC camera, which datum is uh, is uh, being seen as. Uh, it could be that the, the permissions is not set up right. So I would double check those two things and, and see if it works. If that doesn't work, I would try to do the same thing on another machine with the same software and see if that works. If that doesn't work either, it's something wrong with the software. Alexander? Those are all good troubleshooting tips. I guess my other question is... Does the saw when you say doesn't detect it, does it actually not see the black magic ATEM at all? 
or if it does and you're getting no picture, what it could be is it could be the dreaded ATEM gray issue that we generally know about where sometimes the video output will just die. So if you do see the black magic option in the pick list I, and you're not getting image, I would actually just try power cycling the ATEM and then see if it comes back. Next question. Next one's from Tommy Chance in, so I'm sorry, we got the wrong, I got the wrong one there. Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. What new MF3 PTZ is coming out at NAB? Got a guy. Yeah, I threw, what would you even call that? I threw that one out to Kyle and Kyle caught it and threw it back. I don't know. I don't know enough about football as to how that works. But a here's double the lateral. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> double lateral. A double lateral. All right. So uh, Zcam and their private group announced uh, this camera here, which is, uh, they didn't say the sensor, but we're all in the group. We're all speculating. There's 16,500 of us. Uh, they did say that it's a uh, 4K, 60 frames per second with phase detection autofocus, uh, 18x uh, optical zoom, PoE plus, Visca. And then it says, and more. And down in the comments here, uh, shipping in August and um, NDI. So that's one of the cool things about uh, being in these, these groups <laughs> is getting some of the info before it actually hits the floor. So that is the camera right there. And I'm looking forward to testing one of these out because uh, it will, depends on the price, depends on uh, how much this thing is going to go for. But after playing uh, with the FR7s, I'm kind of leaning that way. I just wish I had 12,000 times. We have four of those plus the glass. That's about 14 grand a camera. So for NAB, we're, we're rocking what, like thirty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in Sony cameras. Thanks, Sony. Well, actually, and they loaned us FX6s. So we got like a hundred grand in cameras plus, plus the controllers. Uh, so this is what the controller looks like for that, uh, those cameras. So we'll see how, uh, we'll see how we control these other uh, Z cams if they're going to come out with a controller as well. It's exciting times. Been fantastic looking at our coverage. We'll be getting into that uh, later. That's something to look look out for. We're having a roundtable discussion later on about our NAB coverage. Also, we have our live coverage to look forward to. So stick around. Uh, we have our uh, links in our email and ways to join. We appreciate um, all of your contributions to our uh, to our questions. Putting questions into our Ask Office Hours Global. Uh, you can throw questions in there anytime. Uh, to ask office hours global and we can grab that we don't answer them anytime we answer them during our office hours but uh, you can feel free to to throw those questions at any time and we even have uh, a, another special code that we have for our um ask uh neb live that we'll have later don't want to confuse you though but thank you for our questions let's go to our next question next one is from tommy chance in saint paul minnesota has anyone seen PTZ Optics' new remote broadcast control? It looks like a beast to me. And then he's got a link there. Courtney? Yeah, I was just, just now taking a look at the website. The, uh, they call it Hive. And it looks like it's uh, web-based. Uh, so it looks like you get a browser interface for it. And I think it works with multiple cameras. Uh, centralized controls, Steam's workflow. Uh, Hive linked hardware advantage, so I guess it, it you have to use their their cameras that support it. Uh, so it lets you control. It lets you uh, uh, have cinematic control. I guess so. It lets you do ease in, ease outs, and uh, complete control of that PTZ auto tracking on any camera. So I guess that's built into the software, not the hardware of the camera. And you can control it over the cloud since it's uh, based in a browser. And apparently it has unlimited custom presets, so you can preset a lot of your settings and go to it. Uh, nobody's used it yet because it's on a wait list. Uh, and it does color correction apparently as well, all built in. And switching and recording, RTMP streaming, ISO input recording, and NDI outputs. Uh, so, gosh, that's a lot of features. So we'll be waiting uh, join the wait list if you have a PTZ camera and let us know how it works. So many tools, so little time. Next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois asks, using Zoom screen share, what is the preferred way to display the presentation mode of Keynote or PowerPoint decks while still having control and view of the preview mode with notes? Yeah, what? There's a, a few different ways of 
sharing on Zoom, you can share a, a window and that has the advantage of you're able to move whatever you need into that particular window, or you can share the app directly. And that has the benefit that you can't um, accidentally show the wrong thing. It's going to be locked onto the window of your app. So using that, um, it's best if you start your presentation first. That way you'll have the correct version of the mode. You'll be able to look at your presentation mode and flip through the different questions. It's helpful if you have an extra screen for this. Some of us in production, we like to have a separate uh, machine that that feeds these in, that kind of simplifies this process. Um, but if you don't have that available to you, it is helpful to have that started first and then start your sharing. That's a lot of people do it the other way around and they wind up sharing um, the, the, they say the quiet part out loud. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, on the keynote, it's uh, play in window. So, um, and then you'd share just that window. But yeah, it's, a, it's under play. And instead of saying full screen, which is the default, you say play in window. And then that way, it's just playing in that window. And then when you do share screen, you don't say share whole screen. You say share just keynote and that window should appear in the same thing in PowerPoint. You can just play in a separate window. It's nice to have dual screens because then you can just have all your notes and the next slide preview uh, in a separate screen and make it bigger so that you can really see everything that's going on. Jason? Yeah, you did say the preferred way. So the preferred way to do this is absolutely with its own Mac Mini, going two out, one into the switcher. That way you are certain that the switcher is the thing that's being broadcast and then just um, picture in picture it and, and like, you know, turn on and off your own preview. There you go. Jason heard best. Go ahead, Bill. Well, and the, the question was um, screen share. Screen share has always been a little problematic for me and it was so problematic because it would tend to throw my machines into a different mode that I wasn't used to. And it, it's also a little problematic when you're doing something into a uh, webinar like we have here because it kind of takes over and changes the nature of things. What I found to be the most useful, uh, you said a separate machine, but it can be something as simple as an iPad or an iPhone that you can run Keynote on and simply use an HDMI out after that to come into something like a tiny switcher. And that even a, the basic original ATEM, which I think you can get for 150 bucks or something like that on the used market, with your iPhone feeding that, and then that feeding your computer off into your Zoom contribution means you have something you can set up, play with, and get ready. And when you're ready to take it, you hit another button on your ATEM, and it just goes out while everything else on your rig stays the same. So that kind of, to me, is the least mental, cognitive load kind of situation to share my screen. Next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas asks, any thoughts on alternatives to small rig? Who are small rigs competitors and how do they stand uh, how do they stand vis-a-vis -vis small rig? Ronnie? Oh, there are too many to mention all, but uh, as a small pick, we can uh, choose between uh, between Sakuto, Tilta, Wooden Camera, Condor Blue, which is a personal favorite, and uh, Camera TV, for instance. Um, uh, Kind of Sakuto is probably the most expensive of all these, and maybe Kamet TV is the most budget friendly of these. So, small rig and uh, kind of tilt and Condor Blue are in the same segment. Um, but I prefer small rig for most of our things. I'm not sure why. It seems like small rig has kind of the best solutions for what we need in our studio and on our rigs. And uh, and the other one does not have a lot of the flexibility or the flexible parts that we need. Um, but another mention is uh, is Tilta, which we have uh, a few uh, things from. Uh, for instance, the the Steadicam rig, which is not Steadicam per se, but it's similar to Steadicam rigs. And we have some uh, some uh, some rig uh, rigging equipment uh, for our uh, uh, RS twos which is the Ronin um, uh, gimbals. Uh, that works really good. And uh, we have the big ring and we have uh, some um, connectivity to the, um, uh, to the easy rig, which we uh, clip onto it. And so we, we also have Tilta, but we are actually buying much more small rig uh, items. Okay. 
Yeah, you won't find a whole lot of small rig in rental houses. So if you look at a rental house, you could kind of see what gets torture tested and a, a lot of its uh, shape, right? Tangerine, the original Noga, that's the ri- original Israeli arm. I like Triad Orbit, depending on what I'm trying to cobble together. Um, their stuff is super, super strong. Um, Kupo, uh, Matthews. So if you need like a Cardellini, well, they call it a Mathalini, but it's a cat. Cardellini. Cardellini is from uh, uh, the Bogan Manfrotto days. So it depends on what you're trying to rig up. If you need clamps, if you need uh, to build out, uh, like uh, Ronnie was saying, a wooden camera makes a lot of the um, the different rigs for map boxes and uh, those kinds of things. So it depends on what you want to do. S- small rig, it, it, they're, they're right there with newer. So if you look at what newer is building, you, you're kind of in that same that same world uh it's inexpensive chinese stuff where some of the other stuff can be machined uh to a a higher quality like the zakudo stuff that ronnie was talking about so you get what you pay for but take a look at the rental houses and you'll you know what i mean but sometimes you just need something a little widget and it's on amazon it'll be there overnight and just get it done so but failure in the field is expensive so like david brady says uh what is it what is this saying quality uh doesn't cost it pays yeah i think that's the, the Courtney? Yeah, you'll find wooden camera. Wooden camera has less of the phone type cages and uh, accessories than it's it's more just most of their stuff, unless they've got a new line out. Uh, from what I've seen in the past, their stuff is designed mainly for the box type cameras like the RED or the C300s or the, uh, you know, any of the higher end uh, Cine cameras to add uh, cheese plates, accessories, follow focus, uh, you know, more perfect matte boxes, quick release plates, those kind of things. Uh, designed more for the camera professional uh, with accessories uh, to, to glom all the accessories onto your camera. Uh, not so much small rig follows their name. It's designed for small setup, smaller cameras and phones and other, other types of film gathering equipment. Go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, one more brand I recently came across, which seems to be the same price point as small as small rig, is Nicey Rig. So <laughs> I don't know how new that company is, but they seem to be making really similar products to small rig. So that's another one to look at. Next question. Next question is from Annie Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Any advantage to the new Sure MV7 Plus? That's interesting. There's a link there. Go ahead, Ronnie. Oh, that was Ronnie. That Ronnie was Settle. Ronnie which um, I double like, muted myself. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So the biggest advantage is that um, it's USB C, right? So the uh, the original MV7 has the micro USB, I believe, and of course you can only plug in and and, and unplug that ten times before it breaks. So USB C is a far more robust uh, connection, and uh, Look, it also comes in Arctic white, which is probably more important than USB-C because that will look super cool on your streams. So, and they also announced uh, Motive um, app uh, is going to be updated where you can plug in several of these by USB and then their software will mix it out for you. Uh, where you could do um, a, a combined recording of everything, or it'll do individual wave files per uh, USB microphone, but it gives you a fader and settings for multiple of them plugged into the computer. So, um, not specific to the uh, to the microphone itself, but the software is being updated, and of course, USB C for the win. So is are the older. Uh, MV7 is going to be compatible with the software. I wonder. Uh, apparently, they are. When I watched this, um, when I watched the uh, the guy from the booth here, he he said yes, it would be compatible. So, okay, so you can get that software with your old MV7 for all yep. ten insertions. Excellent. Uh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Ronnie Hofstein. Yeah. So, um, based on the fact alone that it's uh, delivered in Arctic white, should uh, probably. Uh, answer the question if I should buy it or not. Uh, but uh, but as Ronnie uh, said, um, 
the USB-C is a little bit more uh, rough and, and can can take a little bit more uh, punishment. So probably for kits that we send out to our clients, uh, I would probably get the USB-C uh, version instead of the micro USB, which uh, is uh, very, very fragile. Alexander. Yeah, I was just looking at the feature set here. So it looks like it has greatly improved DSP. They are claiming that they have a noise suppression feature that it can actually separate your voice from uh, the background. So that'll be interesting. We'll have to test that and see just how well that works. The one thing that uh, I, uh, that I see that stands out to is a quote unquote digital pop filter. I wonder what they mean about that. Again, uh, you know, I always get skeptical when I see marketing stuff like that it says digital pop filter, remove all the plosives. So I don't know how well that's going to work. We'll have to test it and see. The other thing that I I, uh, I noticed just by looking at the photo is it looks like the the windsock that's on top of it is slightly longer and it looks more like the one that's on the actual SM7B, which would be good for minimizing plosives because I found that the um, the problem with the MV7 is that the the windsock is like right up against the grill. Uh, where the capsule is. So there's not really much separation between the capsule and where your mouth is. And if this, if the capsule is mounted farther back, that should help minimize plosives as well. So looks like an interesting upgrade. Next question. Next one is from Pedro G. Gonzalez in Oklahoma City, planning a trip to a remote location in South America and will take camera gear and computers, etc., Trip will involve small, uh, smaller planes and may have questionable ground transportation. What are your recommendations for durable luggage or packing tips? Help them out, Jason. Okay, anytime you're going to do this, you can't bring the kitchen sink. I'm going to say that again. You can't bring the kitchen sink. It may actually be cheaper to get another plane ticket with a PA so that you can guard your own gear. I had the unfortunate experience in Vegas of having three Pelican cases and two arms. And I knew that, but, you know, it, it's just, it's something you end up getting used to. Along those lines, just remember that, you know, you can get really small Pelican cases. This one is not big. This is, what, the 1535. You can take more than one of these and put it in a duffel bag. Also, put a desiccant in there. Uh, do yourself a favor if you're going to be in South America. And um, yeah, you, you'll be fine. But but understand, there is no substitute for another pair of eyes. May also make your trip more fun. Courtney? Yeah, I agree with uh, what was said by Jason that the uh, 1510 is a good equipment case. Uh, it depends on the size of your equipment. And if you look at the 1510, it has wheels and it has an extendable uh, uh, carrying handle that it is a little bit heavier. The problem with this is going to be with these hard cases. This will definitely protect the equipment and will fit in the overhead uh, baggage storage in most, uh, you know, 737s and up. Um, one problem with a hard case, if you are traveling in, you say, smaller planes, especially if it's like a single engine Cessna or something like that, if you're puddle jumping in, you know, private planes, sometimes those hard cases become a problem because they will not fit in the in the baggage compartment. You may have to carry them in the cabin with you on your lap or something if they won't fit in. And a soft bag in that case will be able to smash itself into that oddly shaped uh, baggage compartments in smaller single engine planes. So I'd find out what type of planes you're going to be traveling on and put your equipment uh, in an appropriate amount. Also, the desiccant's a good idea. Get some package desiccant that's almost disposable. Uh, if it goes, uh, if once it it changes color. There's some with indicators on it and clear, clear packages so that you can see it changes from blue to orange. Let's say one it, once it's ex, uh, absorbed all the moisture it can, and especially if you're traveling in a in an area where is super high humidity, like the Amazon jungles. So take your desiccant and hard case to keep. The, the nice thing also about the pelicans is they're hermetically sealed. So if you have to leave it out in the jungle overnight and it's raining, pouring down rain. Uh, it won't be wet uh, because of leakage through zippers and things in soft bag. Dad, Ronnie. So most of the airline companies uh, are limiting limiting uh, check in baggage for the normal fare. So uh, unless you are paying extra for that, uh, to um, 
62 inches, which is equal uh, 158 centimeters, if I'm not wrong. So most of the cases we purchase from Pelican is within those um, limits, um, just to to you know um, not pay ex- a lot of extra. And if you go over those measurements, you will pay a lot of extra uh, cash for those uh, checked in uh, baggages. But as um, has been said. Uh, previously uh, you also have to check with the airline uh, uh, and see if those measurements are the same uh, on those flights because the planes can be smaller and have other um, other limits uh, and and the one that we found that fits best inside uh, this um, uh, limits is the uh, pelican 1650 i think if that's right yeah i think the 1650 but we also have the 15 35 as a, a good uh, alternative so and of course if you have lots of heavy equipment you should look at the air series from pelican because they are a little bit lighter but they are also not as uh, rugged as the, the the bigger brother which is also um, a lot heavier go ahead bill Also, um, if I was going on small planes, I would be seriously thinking about not doing the hard Pelican cases. I'd be thinking about a photographer's backpack kind of thing. Uh, Now, obviously, this is not good advice if you have to take actual uh, computers and things like that. But if you can, many of those slip a backpack down the back. They're very heavily padded. The advantage to me is that it's always with you. And the photographer's backpack have units inside that you can kind of reconfigure to keep all your small accessories and things like that. I would do that and maybe some sort of a additional pack a lot of those backpack systems you can extend the storage a little bit but i like the idea of it being soft and i like the idea of it always being on my back because as jason said the potential for this screams camera and it would be a very uh, expensive thing to have stolen from you not a good idea on a trip like that so i want everything kind of that if it's on my back, I know it's there. And if the key pieces of gear for me to get my job done are on my back at all times, I'm I'm less nervous in traveling. Just how I look at it. Jump back in, Jason. Sure. Okay. Yes. Pelican airs are absolutely not nearly as durable. And this is the 1615. And just to give you a sense of this, this is precisely. 62 inches. Airlines hate that because it is to the millimeter. It's not going to help you, but I I just realized, wait a minute, it's in the other room. I might as well just show it to you. Go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, and also be aware of theft. So don't have a lot of logos on your cases while traveling. Uh, It could actually be be, uh, a good idea to have... uh, texts on the bag that actually repel uh, people from stealing it. So find logos that are not interesting for people to steal at all. Be travel savvy. Let's go to our next question. Robert Sabavari in Poland asks, any recommendations for a good direct attached storage for M.2 and SATA drives? I require a DAS to transfer large video recordings from cameras at venues to a safe place when good internet access is not available. Um, I don't have any particular um, brands to recommend for you, uh, but Courtney might. Just as I was reaching for the keyboard to search for it, OWC makes some caddies that you can get to put your M.2 uh, NVMe drives in that have uh, USB 3.1 interconnects. So they're fairly high speed, 1500 uh, or so gigabits per second. Uh, the I've used several of them. They work fine. I've tested the speed on them, and they they're up there in the one thousand or greater gigabits uh, area, which is nice for speedy speedily transferring stuff. As long as your computer uh, supports that over its USB C or USB A connections, uh, three point one. So uh, and and they're fairly cheap. They're in the you can get them on Amazon. Uh, OWC is more of a name price. You can get the Chinese ones that are guaranteed to run at high speed uh, and support the higher speed USB uh, above five megabits. So uh, take a look at those. You can get them for around 35 bucks. Jason? If you have an Apple Silicon Mac, this is the OWC Express 1 M2 enclosure. And uh, look at the, the heat sink on that. 
Uh, yeah, it's a little heavy, but it, especially if you are using current Apple silicone, it is incredibly fast and under a hundred bucks. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, Guy, how did you connect the PTZ controller at NAB to your system? Did you use tall scale or a similar VPN? Yeah, Guy. Yeah, I didn't use tail scale. Um, so on site, they're using a, a pep link and uh, Jonas created a profile for me. And the profile that he created, I was able to attach to with my Ubiquiti Dream Machine. But because of the way that it was set up, it actually uh, was usually utilizing all the traffic in my site through their site. So and they only have like a 50 to 100 megabit um uh, dedicated line. So I wound up buying one of these, uh, which is a GLI net, uh, ATX 1800 and using open VPN, loading that profile into this $112 device and connected to one, uh, of those ethernet ports is this laptop where I'm seeing Alex's head right now. Um, and he's talking to somebody. Uh, so this, this controls the cameras, um, and all the, all the interface. Uh, but I, because these previews take up about 20 megabytes uh, or 20 megabits a piece and we have four cameras, I'm, I'm uh, just using the controller and we made a custom multi-view that shows me all the cameras through, through web. So we're using Dash Master and web with an encoder on site. And there's a little bit of a delay, but uh, it's working. And uh, uh, I think I can do something a little bit fancier with some SRT, but uh, I'll have to talk to Jonas when we get a, a, a break to figure out uh, what's the best way going forward to do this kind of thing. But yeah, hardware VPN with uh, not tail scale, but that fancy GLI net for 112 bucks. You can expand your Cochrane offerings of having a PTZ camera you control back on yourself. Go ahead, Roddy. Yeah, um, just to expand on that, uh, because uh, tail scale is something that more people should actually look into using these types of uh, home studios that we are using. So um, the... Um, uh, this is the Slate Plus, which is the smallest from uh, GL Init that actually uh, handles uh, um, tail scale very well. So you can have tail scale enabled on this client or this rotor, put it on your hotel room, and you have access to everything that you have on the tail scale network. That could either be devices that are put behind these uh, uh, elsewhere in your private network, like uh, our studio, our remote uh, control room, etc. And you can access everything behind these if they don't have um, uh, the option to connect to the Tailscale network themselves. So this acts just like a rotor also for Tailscale. So we are remotely access uh, accessing everything from our light uh our sound system or mixers, we access uh, ATEMs, we access, um, uh, of course, Stream Deck using the, the Stream Deck satellite uh, systems. So we can actually just, by utilizing these really, really, really cheap rotors that are high speed and, uh, and really stable, we can actually just make our own uh, production network in no time. And it's so easy. If you have questions about using Tailscale, hit me up on Discord and I'll... Show you the light. Fantastic. Next question. Pedro G. Gonzalez in Oklahoma City asks, what pitfalls or problems may I encounter when taking expensive camera gear to locations like Argentina and Chile? Border crossings will be part of the planning. Courtney. Uh, yeah, besides the proper cases, which we talked about earlier, is obtain an ATA international carnet which uh, an international carnet is like a manifest of all your high-end uh, camera gear that you're going to be traveling with, with the serial numbers on it, to let uh, every time you cross a border, uh, you're subject to them confiscating all your camera equipment until you pay import duties on it. Because that lets them know, the international carnet lets them know that you're going to be traveling back out of the country with the same camera equipment uh, when you exit and so that you will not have to pay import duties on entry into a country. I learned this the hard way. We flew to Africa with uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth of Panavision equipment. And uh, they had it for three days until we could give them $35,000 in cash as import duties because we didn't have at Carnet. We just you know, bribed the sky cap, split it on the plane, and surprise, they confiscated it. So uh, make sure, that's, that's a little... Uh, 
tip for you traveling uh, across country and across borders. It will ease things in carrying equipment and won't hold you up in customs for days. We appreciate that. Heads up, personal experience. Good, Bill. What Courtney said. Nice. Well covered. Next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas asks, what do you do with the two SATA ports on a Synology NAS? Jason. The cynic in me says, find yourself wishing you bought a larger Synology drive so that you're not looking at the eSATA ports on the back of your um, Synology NAS. Yes, you can use this uh, annoying kind of $500 additional thing to get a couple more, and it's going to look weird and awkward, and you now need to power that too additionally. But um, yeah, those are eSATA ports, and they're, they're a pain in the butt. So pr- rethink getting a larger one. Dongles live everywhere, Jason. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, Roland has a video to DMX converter that drives lights based on a video image. Is there any practical use case for this box or should video and lighting not meet? Ronnie, you want to tackle that one? Um, I would say that this box is probably mostly um, angled towards DJs and uh, live uh, performances to easily be able to map things onto uh, DMX uh, devices. We are using something similar, but we are uh, using software for that. Um, and uh, with the, the release of the Infinimat from Aperture, we will probably be using um, uh, Resolume Arena to map uh, or pixel map the colors from a video image onto the Infinimat from Aperture that are being released these in these days in uh, NAB we talked about it yesterday um so i would be using this for for mapping colors from a video source onto these type of pixel mats not necessarily for controlling separate types of pictures that are placed like uh, moving heads or similar but for for bigger matrix uh, things i would see that it's uh, usable but i would probably be using software for for that mapping and to have a much larger capacity and using uh, SACN, uh, et cetera, for for doing that communication with the fixtures. Courtney? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if this particular video to DMX device does this, but there are uh, moving head projectors out there that have, uh, it just looks like a Verilite or a moving head light. Uh, DMX operated light only instead of a light source in there it has a actual video projector and so you can project a video image and it can move it around uh, and focus it and uh, use it as a lighting element or you can actually project video images onto walls and so on to use for backgrounds and things and have the videos actually moving around uh, under DMX control. So maybe that's what the purpose of this adapter is to do, is to run those type of projectors that are uh, movable and DMX controllable. Next question. Next one's from Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas. Introduced just last month on March 14th, 2024, is M1 Apple's foray into the realm of large language models going to be a game changer? Go ahead, Jason. Um, It was introduced as an article that wasn't a direct source, and it was completely speculative, so nobody knows. And Bill? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. It's interesting, you know, I I read just the other day that Apple had made a huge investment in uh, Shutterstock and Getty Images. They they bought, they spent a lot of money in there. And what they're doing, I think, with that is training their AI. So it is a long-range process for Apple, like all of other Apple initiatives. When, When it's very popular technology, they don't try to be first out with it. They don't try to get in the horse race. They really want to do something different. All right. And um, we are about to get into our second hour. We have a, a fantastic um, summary of NAB content coming up for you. So stick to. All right. Welcome back to our second hour. This is a, se- a second hour discussion that's dedicated to our NAB 
uh, roundtable. Um, we are a buzz, especially this being our <laughs> our very uh, very much most focused uh, event of the year. We have a lot of uh, folks that are yet on NAB right now, and we have some representative here that can help us out with our table discussion. So at this time, um, happy to get the panelists' uh, thoughts on that. Um, Happy to talk about uh, your discussions, your points of view as far as where we're going with our production. Talking about you know what you expect, what you anticipate. We already have one day of our NAB coverage uh, in the books, so we have a panel discussion. This could be a very short discussion uh, if Josh has to stretch, <laughs> but but don't feel don't feel shy. Uh, what do you think about what where we're going with our NAB? Uh, go ahead, Alexander. Well, one of the things that I'm always curious about is because uh, I haven't followed any B for for that long, more so in the last three years or so. But I'm curious for people that have actually gone there. Are we seeing more trends uh, towards products that cater to the lower cost segment, the content creators, the podcasters, the YouTubers? Are we seeing more of that kind of stuff? Because it seemed like to me in the past, NAB was always this whole other level that I could never really get to. And I know that's changing a little bit, but I'm curious what people who are, you know, on the front lines, what they think about that. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, hopefully I'm, whatever audio problem was there. So here's the thing about NAB. Um, it is massive. If, if you've never been there, I mean, what you will see on our coverage, you will see little tiny slices, and I think we covered maybe seven or eight booths. Understand, it feels like there are 4,000 booths when you walk into NAB. It, it's three gigantic halls. Because of that, and everything from the top to the bottom, uh, and all sorts of gradations in between. The issue that you run into is there's so much to see. That I could say yes to, will there be a lot of stuff for content creators for small, you know, one person operators? Yes, there will be a lot of stuff for that. Will there be a lot for huge national level broadcast operations? Yes, there will be a lot for that. You get overwhelmed with these gigantic booths from the major companies. You know, Sony's booth literally is gigantic and they have everything from their line of broadcast work stuff all the way down to the little camcorders and everything in between. I mean, they often do a giant theater that shows kind of what Sony is thinking about in terms of their large uh, projection and gigantic screens. And, you know, that'll just be a huge place where 30 people can sit and look at the latest in their display technology. And it won't just be Sony. There will be 50 booths in NAB that have those giant screens. You know, we're starting to see that virtual reality kind of, uh, you can shoot and map people into something with motion camera rigs. All that fancy, gigantic toy stuff is well represented with really large booths. But around the perfer peripherals, there's also just gigantic numbers of small operators who have a good idea and hope they can come to NAB and sell it. So it's, it's really hard to pick trends, you know? Uh, over the course of time, we have seen a couple of trends emerge. The digitization of all of video from the analog era. We could see that coming kind of early at NAB. I could see the, the change from traditional tungsten lighting to these more chip on board kinds of things. I could see that coming from an early NAB when you just started to say, oh, wow, a lot less power for a lot more light with a lot less heat. I'm in. And you knew it wasn't right then, but you knew in three or four years it would be the standard because it just made too much sense. Those are the kind of things that go into NAB kind of brings to your brain. But you just have to kind of get the craziness out of your head first and concentrate because it's just pretty overwhelming to be there. Absolutely. We're anticipating much more. And one of our NAB veterans, Courtney. Yeah, and every NAB is a little bit different. There's always the uh, uh, the darling of the of the convention each year. You know, three or four years ago, it was uh, 3D acquisition. You know, so everybody was showing these camera rigs with dual cameras and beam splitters, and uh, for acquiring live 3D and 3D broadcast and uh, 3D uh, distribution, screen distribution, projection, all of that. And then uh, two years later. Hey, there was no 3D in AP. This year, it's AI is the darling of the convention, it seems. And everybody's introducing a new product with now with AI, you know. So 
Uh, <laughs> you see all kinds of things. Uh, I'd like another thing I like to see at NAB is to besides the huge booths where you can just spend an eternity. Sometimes you may have to wait ten or fifteen minutes before you can actually speak to someone in person because there's a line of people asking questions uh, to the technicians and operators there that are answering questions about new equipment. Uh, but one thing I like to do is go to like the South Hall and go uh, upstairs or downstairs at the back of that South Hall, and that South Hall is like four. Uh, city blocks long. So it's humongous and it's two levels. So just when you think you're getting to the end of it, you go, oh, this is, there's a little drop off halfway where you go down some stairs. And then there's a whole nother block long <laughs> segment of the South Hall that you haven't gotten to. So uh, if they filled it up again, there was some, uh, a couple of, there was an NAB after the uh, first time they came back after COVID. Uh, they, uh, there was it was a lot smaller show than a lot less people were were there, and so they didn't quite fill up those halls. But I think it's it's fighting is way back to uh, full occupancy now. It seems to be, and a lot of people are coming back and and going into those small booths. And that's where I discovered like Red Byte Systems, who does the decimators, decimator lines of little boxes, and it's so interesting to sit and you can talk to those guys for. 10 or 15 minutes, and they're very personable and can give you all kinds of information. And you can make suggestions about products you'd like to see in the future. And a lot of times they're pretty percept uh, receptive of those uh, suggestions. I can't wait to visit the uh, Black Magic booth if we're going to be able to get over there uh, on our show, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. I don't know what the schedule is. Uh, or maybe have someone, a representative from Black Magic in our booth, who can give us a rundown on the 5,000 new products that they just introduced last week. Yeah, I think that really sums it up, uh, Courtney, whenever you say, I hope we go and visit the booth. And it really is an experience where we're kind of all moving together, uh, having our representatives there. Um, Ronnie, uh, you're someone that's uh, used to visiting the show floor directly. What do you think about uh, visiting the way that we do it now? I think it's uh, much more uh, appreci appreciative. Um, so um, compared to last year when I was on the floor producing, uh, being here in the panel and just kind of experience what they are, I feel that I can dive more into the information and actually pick up more uh, more uh, details about the products. And the way we do it, we just kind of um, slumping into a booth and, and talking about, like we did ye uh, uh, yesterday, uh, talking about lenses and filters and, and, and the way to uh, kind of communicate that to, to all the, the community members and all that watches these, uh, these uh, productions is kind of really cool. And I, I would wish we, we had kind of, and maybe next year or maybe even this year, we have a kind of more small talks around all those hundreds of small vendors that are never being picked up and and hit the mainstream of information because there are a few of those uh, technologies and that's not just about ai it could be anything from new mounting equipment to 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 a new type of tape or whatever so um just kind of trying to pick up all the cool things and then there is the problem it's too many so we had to have like hundreds of people trolling all these booths and talking to all these uh, vendors just to get a kind of an overview. And then we had to have a, um, a a group of people that selected we are going there, we are go not going there, etc. So it's it's really overwhelming, as as Bill said. It's it's so much and and kind of looking this through um, the NAB coverage that we do here in office hours. It's a little bit easier. It's uh, more, more, uh, yeah, I like it. Absolutely. And we're going to be going through uh, for the rest of the week, we're going to have each of our vertical days, we're going to fo take a focus on each of the things that we're looking at and comparison to things that we're gleaming. So it's something to keep in mind. So for example, on our graphics day, we'll be looking at graphics things and audio uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we are particularly focused today on looking at the things on business marketing and and ways that we're running our projects uh, that we see at NAB. And there, we did see, um, I didn't see a lot of our, um, you know, our organization things, you know, the, the, the boring, it tends to be the boring things that uh, 
help our logistics and planning. Uh, but some of the marketing and um, the other the other things that help enhance advertising and reaching clients, and uh, of course, you know any of the AI. I think uh, Monday has a has a, has a good scoop on covering the AI topic. So that's the format of uh, what we're looking for through the rest of the rest of the week. We'll take our uh, NEB coverage uh, for our special live event coverage, and we'll get a chance to look at each of the verticals and really sink into you know what we're looking at as professional audio, video, uh, graphics, and other individuals. Um, there's a lot there um, that, that we simply just churn and churn if we just had to to talk about you know all the things we liked about NEB for all of the different days of the week. But this kind of keeps us focused in thinking about a particular topic and it doesn't uh, steal any of our, our thunder for our later coverage of our NAB. And keep in mind too, that later on in the week, we're going to have a how we nabbed uh, Vegas. So we're going to go back and look at some of our, our discussion and see you know what we liked, what we didn't like. Um, still very much in an iteration about how we're covering the program. We're learning things about, you know, what works, what doesn't work. We're figuring out what things we thought worked and, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, things that, that we're doing too, but um, that'll help our discussion. Just talking about this particular vertical on Monday about, you know, what we're talking, looking for business, marketing, and those type of topics as well. But we do have a couple of questions uh, piling in. So let's get into your questions. Um, Alexander, what do we have? All right. First question of the second hour is from Zach Stahlsmith in Chautauqua, New York. What are some of the coolest products we've seen so far at NAB? guy yeah like bill was saying it's just a it's a massive playground it's just a, a big disneyland and there's been a few announcements i've been keeping a running tally um as to um what i've seen that that might pique our interest but the the cool thing that we're doing is we're we're going around and we're actually stumbling upon things so like one year i stumbled upon the clearcaster which i wound up buying becoming a dealer selling a bunch of them and put, getting them installed in people's uh, various trucks and studios and so sometimes it's the 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 beta so on that i was also on the facebook beta uh, and found out some some of the stuff that was behind the scenes this was when html5 was just becoming a, a thing uh, so we could punch graphics in through html5 so that's the beauty of nab but some of the products i'll just show you like five or so uh the first one that we'll take a look at is uh, road has a new interview pro and this idea i believe came from the the hhb flash mic which was a thousand dollars it's this basically is a omnidirectional handheld that works with their wireless, their Go series, uh, but it also has a recorder. So it can record uh, in 32-bit float, and that's a cool little handheld for 249 bucks instead of the HHB flash mic, which came out in like 2005, and it was a thousand bucks. This thing's 249, so that's one cool thing. And then switching over to the high side, um, Fujinon had the 24 to 300, which is a big old massive lens that I would love to own. But at the show, the debut is the Duvo uh, 14 to 100 T2.9. That's a servo lens uh, in PL mount. Uh, that would be a nice, uh, to, to go with along with your new Blackmagic uh, 6K, that would be a nice pairing. A 14 to 100 is great range. Sony also announced uh, a couple uh, competitors to our, our favorite uh, UE 150s on the Panasonic side. They've uh, had some robotic cameras that were long in the tooth. And so now we've got the BRC AM7 pricing we haven't heard yet, but uh, a really cool AI auto tracking. So I'm excited to see that. Hopefully we can get over to the booth and take a look at that. Deity uh, has a new plug-on transmitter. This also can transmit and record, which is uh, one of the rarities in the US that's available in Europe and the rest of the world, but we haven't had that due to a patent uh, dispute with uh, Zaxcom, but uh, Deity hooked up with... Uh, with Glenn Sanders over there and they made a deal and uh, Deity's allowed to do that. So that, that'll be a cool booth to stop by. We had uh, yesterday Aperture talk about the Infinimats, which look really cool, inflatable pump up lighting uh, that can be scaled as, as large as you want. And then also the Citus Link uh, app. I'm excited about the 12K camera and the 17K <laughs> sensor uh, for IMAX resolutions. Uh, I would love to drop by the booth. Hopefully we can get over there and take a look at the 12K and talk about when when they're going to release that 17K and what the pricing will be. Also just excited about the, the the updates that they've put out right now. It's in beta for the 6K to be a webcam. So, And I'd like to take a look at some of the REST API stuff. 
Also at the Shep's booth, they've got a new uh, amplifier for the Colette series. So if you have a recorder that can do AES uh, 42, this thing will be a complete digital. Uh, you know, so you could take like a 40 year old microphone and stick it on this this uh, in their line, uh, and now it becomes a pure digital, which makes it susceptible to zero interference. So I was watching a uh, Gotham Sound had some great coverage yesterday. Um, if you're an audiophile, jump over to uh, Gotham Sound's YouTube. They've been hit cruising around the floor. At first, I was making fun of them for trying to do live coverage because their rig was kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of stuff. And I'm like, stick to audio guys because they're they're really great audio guys. Uh, but as soon as they got into like the deity booth and started talking. Um, they really know their stuff. I mean, they'll spend 40 minutes at the, at the, uh, uh, Reading audio booth. And, uh, if, if you can hop in, I'll put a link in the chat to their channel, uh, cause they've got great coverage that goes deep in audio and I love audio. So that's, that's some, some of the cool things that I've seen so far. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more and we'll be covering over the next few days. Awesome. Ronnie said, yeah, so some of the things uh, I'm most excited about, I, I mean, I, I think this is going to be very, very transitional. Um, Black Magic is making like a full court press into 2110 now, uh, moving away from uh, SDI, although f still fully embracing it, but, um, you know, making this available um, to, 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 to everybody, with, especially with their, their Switch. Um, where you can just hook the cameras up, hook the uh, your converters up, and route them any way that you want. They're going to be updating the firmware for the cameras so that they'll do a 2110 back. They have this really cool uh, presentation converter where if you're, um, you know, for example, doing um, Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever, you just plug the computer into USB-C and then it automatically converts it out there. Um, also, our friends over at Liminal um, have announced that... Uh, there's going to be a new Zoom ISO update for AJA. They're going to be also embracing 2110. And um, they're going to be doing a Zoom Tiles app, which will give you a much better way of organizing um, your layouts for hybrid events. And uh, let's see. Their, their Zoom's uh, Rooms Pro AV is embracing Dante and NDI, which is, which is very cool. And then... Um, DJI um, has released their new gimbal, which has the new um, LiDAR, which is going to help focus, especially, you know, for those of us who are, you know, not rocking the Sonys, but we're rocking the Black Magics. And it's going to give us a very good autofocus with the LiDAR. Um, and they've, they've, they had a previous version, but they've got a new version, which I'm excited to see how that's going to work. So. Very cool. Thanks for those uh, summaries. There's so much there. It feels like we're going to have to take some weeks off to digest all of this after our, after our program. Let's go to the next program. Next question. Robert Sabavity in Poland asks, Guy, can you talk about your experience yesterday operating the Sony PTZ cameras, more than one remotely? How did you know what to look for? Zoom out, zoom in, or did you have a bird's eye view of the whole floor with the booths? Okay. So we have four cameras at the booth. Uh, two of them are basically trained on the talent and any, any guests that come. So yesterday it was mostly Bill. And so I, I had a dead on straight, you know, down the barrel shot like you're seeing now. And then we had a second shot that was kind of a profile or side view, which can also be for a, a second guess. And then we had more of a bird's eye view of both guests at the table. And if they had any uh, object that they brought, that would be a punch in close up camera. So I could train, uh, I, basically the controller has a button on it that says, uh, you know, camera one through 10. And you can even go more than that. But um, basically this, I'm pressing, like if I want to take control of camera one, I would just press one. And then I have presets here that I can uh, define and I have a notepad. Uh, so if if I'm using the app, the app's really cool because I could see the thumbnail of my shot. But right now, because I don't have, uh, it requires so much bandwidth to run the app, uh, I'm not able to see my thumbnails as to what the shots are. So if, if uh, they say, hey, we want a close up of the behind the scenes, can you show Andy on the Unreal Engine? Uh, I have to look at my note first because I haven't memorized all these. This is where having a dedicated operator, you know, trying to be on the panel plus trying to operate four cameras, it's, a, it's two different minds. And so part of me was just like wishing I had a little more direction with the comms because when I do this stuff on site, you know, I'm usually, I've got 
the TD right right by me and the director right by me and they're calling shots and I can communicate with them through comms or just a lot of times you can see what's going on and you can kind of stage up shots and you know when you're you're hot right now my multi view is not giving me the accurate information which tells me when I'm in preview because normally when you're in preview you don't you don't mess around with that shot you just you unless you you're told that uh, uh, you can you know like go ahead find find me another shot so normally you have a little bit more direction so that's what we're missing right now and we'll I'm sure we'll talk about some of the, the stuff in our in our RFI meeting uh, but one of the things that I would love to have is better tally control so I know when I can go ahead and safely move that camera and not get caught, you know, getting uh, hot when you're in in motion because it gets pretty sloppy if you're if you're uh, trying to joystick around with latency. So that's the problem that I'm dealing with is a little bit of latency because of the way the multi viewer is getting passed over. Um, I'm not sure what encoder we're using, but basically the multi view is going up to the web, then it's coming back to me. And so I'm trying to figure out how we can reduce that latency to get the picture to me fast so that as I'm making my finite moves, when they say Bill uh, has too much headroom, or actually no, it was the next guy. It was Michael Cioni is much shorter than Bill, so there was too much headroom. And because I was on the panel talking, I looked over and I was like, oh my gosh, he looks like a midget. You know, it's like this. And then I hear over Brian over calm say, guy, watch your headroom. And I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, nudge. The, okay, so you got to press camera one. Then nudge down, and then I went too far, and then it was like, uh oh, now I got to go back up. So that latency can be a real drag because it's almost a full second, and I'm not used. To, I'm used to being on site where I can see stuff, you know, fast. So I'm sure it's the same thing with the accidental theater, and, and when we're doing this stuff with uh, with the guys in Belfast using the Belfast method. They, if you do this stuff every weekend, I'm sure you get used to the latency and you get used to the rhythm as to how how much you can have because there's actually controls for the speed so this this dial here allows for the speed at which uh you can move the camera so oh there's alex right now so i'm gonna tilt down on alex you guys can't see what i'm doing so yeah it takes it just takes another second for it to to go down and so that delay can get confusing because uh you're, you know, you're looking at something and you're making a, an adjustment and you think that you got it right, but depending on how fast that speed was last set out will determine how aggressively that thing moves in motion. When you're on site, it's fluid, it's nice, and it's easy, and you get into a rhythm of how fast to track somebody uh, because the, those controllers, the joystick, can be very sensitive. If you want it to go very, very slow, you just put it on, you rotate the knob to slow, and then you move it across. But so far, it's been a, a great experience. I, we're not tying up a person on site um, there is an identical controller on site, uh, but the engineer that's down there, Kevin, he has a lot on his plate. So he's running the Constellation, which actually, because I'm VPN, I have access to the Constellation as well. So I can I have the uh, ATEM software control here, so I can control the switcher as well to, and get access to the encoders. It's amazing what a VPN can do uh, when it's all properly set up by a real engineer. So hats off to you, Kevin and Jonas. Uh, and actually, we'll probably show it. We, there's one other way that we, I can control uh, which Kirsten has been helping. She's she's doing a lot of work behind the scenes too, but we, Jonas invented something called Remote B, which we'll take a look at, which gives me even more access to another uh, Stream Deck type control and a multi-view all in one web page. And then it's protected by a Cloudflare uh, tunnel so that uh, not anybody can just get in there and, and mess up our shots. So a lot of cool stuff. We're going to need more guys. We appreciate uh, you guys, you taking notes and... Um... It, it almost seems like if if there is a technical way to get the latency down, it would be great to make those fine adjustments. I almost wonder if if it's worth having someone that's uh, local just for those those low latency adjustments, and then have, you know sending more of the brain work uh, off. It might be might be something worth looking into. Um, Ronnie Hoffsey, um, this is a question to Guy uh, for the process. I, are you? Do you know where the latency actually uh, is introduced to the to the flow? Is it uh, the return multi view, or is it actually the Sony? It's the protocol? return multi. It's the return multi view because it's going up to the cloud, up to a Linux instance running Nimble Streamer, and then that's flipping it around web and sending it back to me. So we're getting a hop, and I'd love to get rid of that hop. But because we only have fifty to one hundred megabits coming out. 
I can't hog up all their bandwidth because that's the stream. You know, that's, <laughs> that's how we're getting, getting it out. So I got to be careful as to how much I hog up because even if I just opened up all four cameras with um, the Sony web browser interface, that would be 80 megs. I would saturate, I would take up their entire connection and that would be hiccups in the stream. So there's got to be a way. Um, I was exploring some of the SRT stuff, trying to dial down the latency and there's RTMP streaming encoding built into the cameras. So that might be a faster way. So um, maybe today after the show's uh, overall, go in there and adjust some of those settings and see if I can just, using SRT mini server and RTMP uh, server, send those in and then NDI those to, me, to these machines and get the fastest, best looking picture. Maybe we can test using the NDI remote uh, through, the, through the same uh, VPN that you are using. Yeah, a NDI bridge. Well, we would need uh, a computer that's uh, burly enough to to do the transcoding. So we just need an extra computer on site that could handle taking those feeds and converting them over. But yeah, uh, that would be certainly be a way. It's just you know having a machine, right? So, right. Yeah. Pen these things out, Alexander. And guy, other than controlling the X and Y axis and obvious uh, zoom controls, I noticed that the control, I've, I've just got a sort of a side view there of the control surface, but there, I noticed there's a lot of buttons on there. What else can you control? Can you go in and adjust aperture and exposure and all the fine details there with that thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so starting from the left here, we have iris and then we have zoom and we have the zoom speed. We also have uh, the ability to shade the camera. There's uh, black and uh, white uh, pedestal and master. Then there's uh, one touch autofocus. So you can just touch it once to temporarily go into autofocus, but you can also switch from auto to manual. And then this is focus far and near. Then these are the uh, camera positional presets and you can hit direct recall and have them punch up right away. So they, they go fast. Um, then there's gain and shutter controls. And then this is to pick the camera that you want. When you're using the actual app, this is what was really cool. Talk about fast. Um, on downstairs, I have a computer that's a 27-inch Dell touchscreen, and because Greg Gibson has these camera, these FR7s as well, I saw how he uses them in the field. And what he does is he uses a, a large touchscreen. He puts all the browser windows up of his four cameras on site, and he just taps to autofocus. So that's what I started doing. In fact, I was showing my grandson. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, here, touch the screen right there. And he touches it. And uh, we were doing camera tests, and we had it set up to in Alex's backyard. I could see you know, there's a chair, and he touches the chair, and it focuses just bam, super fast. But that was directly connected uh, that time, so it went right in, and the touch to focus was like instant. So that's one of the cool things about having not just the controller, but having the web, the Sony web browser. So here's the web browser. Um, can't, I know you guys can't see it, but there's there's a lot more settings inside of here. Uh, you could turn on the ND filters. You could change the pan tilt speed. There's uh, audio settings. Uh, this is how I was able to adjust the white balance. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in here. And then here's the presets on the left here to where I can actually visibly see the thumbnails. And this is where I think Panasonic has a little bit of a leg up on on Sony. On my Panasonic, like the UE150s, I can build those thumbnails out and then I could just let's say it's a volunteer, I could just say, hey, here's your screen. Just touch those. Just on the touch screen, just touch those shots and it'll jump right to those shots. Here on the Sony, I actually have to hit recall. I have to touch the thumbnail, then hit recall, and then it goes to it instead of just touch and go. So I hope, hopefully Sony will uh, have a way to do that so it's a little bit faster and cleaner. Uh, so you can just hop, especially like in church organizations where it's like hop from the crowd shot to the to the podium shot, you know, with one touch. If only we could have someone uh, at Sony we could speak to. <laughs> sure, there's somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're, we're definitely roughing a lot of this stuff up. Let's go to our next question. Next one's from Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Amid the store full of new Black Magic goodies announced last week, are there any updates for the speed editor? Courtney, did you hear anything? I didn't see anything for the speed editor. Of course, you know, they a lot of their uh, demo was taken up with this new uh, replay editor. You know, the speed editor, when it came out, they were including it for free, bundled with uh, the studio, full studio version of, of uh, uh, Resolve. So maybe they're still bundling it for free, but it's only $400. Or you can get this... Uh, the Resolve full editor keyboard, which combines the QWERTY keyboard with the special keycaps for the the quick, you know, you know the quick shortcut keys. 
uh, on the with the colored keys on the keyboard. But they spent a lot of time on this replay editor where they added this whole new ability to have a replay track uh, in the cut or maybe in the cut uh, tab of uh, DaVinci 19. And uh, they built in the controls uh, for this uh, replay editor, which lets, lets you do instant replays. And they also added this uh, DaVinci Resolve micro con color control panel, which is only 500 bucks, which you know previously it cost you a couple of grand or $27,000 for hardware control for professional color correction. Uh, you see in, in a lot of... Uh, Color correction suites, you'll see this $30,000 masterpiece here for doing DaVinci Resolve. But you can get in for the cheap price of $509 for this mini one. And it seemed to have some fairly high quality trackballs in there. So uh, that's a good entryway in if you're going to get your feet wet in uh, uh, color correction. Uh, that's a good way to get in. And those are the the new things that they're promoing. I guess they will, uh, the mini editor. Uh, they will continue to support it, of course, but I don't know if there are any changes specific to that uh, that device that were made with this, all these latest announcements. Yeah, Graham, I, I was interested in that too. I also got the you know, Speed Editor, uh, unbelievable deal with the full version of DaVinci, and I didn't see anything as far as the upgrade of the functionality of the Speed Editor. However, if you look at the um, the keys that you have um, on the speed editor, you've got the jog wheel, you've got the camera buttons. You have a lot of the same functionality that you do for the, the replay editor. Obviously, you're going to be missing some things. So, you know, if you were looking specifically to do the replay function, I'm sure that that is kitted out perfectly. But when Blackmagic originally released the speed editor, they were really pushing the edit page for it. And that's where it's mostly designed to be used. However, you can, and a lot of people do, I've used it as well on the edit page. And so while it's not you know, specifically made or updated for the functions, having those keys uh, is definitely something you can do. Um, I think that just the value of something that has that, that jog on it, it, it makes it worthwhile. Go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, I can't remember that they talked about any changes to the speed editor, but of course there will be some kind of firmware updates. And I wouldn't be surprised if you can use some of the uh, the new functions in uh, DaVinci Resolve also by utilizing existing speed editor consoles or, or uh, controls. So uh, we can uh, play with this in, uh, in after hours. Next question. We have a QR code question here from Clive G. Ludford in Kingston, Jamaica. Any new switchers coming out for the sub uh, $1,500 market? I'm sure that there's plenty of um, brands we that have uh, pushed forward a few different things. We've had a few uh, different that have popped on the show. Guy? Uh, nothing new, but I mean, I'd be looking at the Roland stuff. Are you doing HD? Um, the, what came out from Blackmagic looks appealing, uh, especially since previously. I mean, if you wanted to go in the HD world still, I, I just wouldn't recommend doing this because at 995, you can get a 1ME Constellation HD, but what was recently announced is this one. So for $295 more than your budget, you get 10 inputs and now you've got 4K and then you've got um, uh, four chroma keyers. Uh, you got the new multi-view. So there, and with their updates and things, this one's more future-proof. Uh, I'm sure it's got a bigger uh, FPGA inside of there. There's just more to uh, more to upgrade. And what we've seen with Blackmagic in the past is that uh, some of those firmware upgrades can un unlock new features. So I would definitely say spend the extra 295 bucks and get one of these. Because then later on, you can also you know get the panel, uh, not that one, but uh, the new, where's the baby one? Uh, so for another 675 bucks, you know, you can get this micro panel. So it goes beyond your budget, but uh, I mean, it, it's just worth it to spend the extra 295 and go ahead and, and use, I, I would use a stream deck. I mean, uh, that's that's a simple way of, you know, getting your cameras. I would get a 32 button though. This is my baby one, but the the ability to just uh, program those things uh, is pretty easy. And you can use a touchscreen computer to cut or you can use a keyboard in the meantime. Uh, but that would be my recommendation is to go with a, a black magic and then lust after a Ross or something, the carbonite. I hear Ross has some pretty cool stuff. In fact, uh, Ronnie tried to show the demo yesterday. Uh, that 
that new feature of being able to do speech cutting is going to be amazing. I can't wait to see what, try it myself and see how well it does after I learn how to talk to it. But cutting, cutting via voice will be very interesting. Let's get this image of someone phoning in and cutting the show and, you know, hang up. Yeah. So fantastic. I agree with some of the offerings that Black Magic has and just a little bit out of your budget, but maybe you can wait for Black Magic Black Friday for it and look for that one instead. Let's go to our next question. Zach Stalsmith in Chautauqua, New York asks, are there any executive staff members from the companies represented at NAB or mostly sales and marketing staff? Ronnie? Most definitely. Uh, yesterday at the NAB broadcast, we had uh, we met uh, Michael from Strada, uh, which is the founder. Uh, we met um, uh, Mr. Stipe from Stipe and all those uh, amazing uh, tracking solutions, both for LED screens and uh, and our LED volumes and green screens. And uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, we also had uh, a guy from a light company. Uh, that was also the founder. I can't remember his name. Ted but, Sim, uh, who was the yeah. Yeah, president of Aperture. Yeah, so most definitely a lot of uh, top people that are uh, sharing their thoughts. And it's mostly not uh, product talk. And, and uh, you know, it's it, we get, uh, we're getting under the skin of the strategies and how they think and what uh, they would like to bring to the future. So it's um, worth listening to the NAB show. Yeah, great interview with Ted. Uh, go, Guy. Yeah, I've been to the show for over 20 years, and the people that are there are the who's who. I mean, y y Ross just did a demo uh, with their um, their original founder. He was he was there, accessible. You could just walk it right up to him. So, And then his son's now running the company. He's present. So a lot of times you'll see the CEO, the founder, and you can walk right up to him. I, Crumbling across my Facebook feed, I've seen five, at least five friends with a picture with Grant <laughs> Petty from Black Magic. So Grant Petty, CEO, billionaire, is accessible. You can just walk right up to him and talk to him. Make sure you kind of calculate what you're going to say. As, as uh, he's he's a busy guy, but uh, he'll hold a conversation with you, especially if you have good ideas. Just uh, don't say NDI. I've I've learned my lesson. Uh, not a good thing to to bring up in the Black Magic booth. Uh, Only twenty one ten. Only twenty one ten. Only twenty one ten. So there's a clue if you're going to go visit. And I can't. I can't even uh, count the amount of times that I've had uh, a backdoor kind of conversation where it's like, "Hey, come into this meeting room, and we're going to show you the new thing that's coming out, or we want your feedback on this thing that's coming out." And so, if you talk to engineers, sometimes uh, you know you might have to sign an NDA, but they'll show you something, and then you can give them your feedback, or they'll ship you one, and you can try it out. So, the floor is definitely an interesting place to cruise around. And, and see products and then sometimes just listen in. Sometimes you just want to, you know, stand next to somebody else who's talking to an engineer already and they're talking about something that you're like, what? I didn't know that they could do that. And next thing you know, you're, you're, you're getting some, some tips that will help you in your production. So it's a great place to be. I mean, this year, I think the numbers I've seen are about 65,000 people uh, registered to attend. The years past were over a hundred thousand, so it seems a little bit lighter. In fact, when I was going to get a hotel, uh, there were still everything was available. And years past, that was like good luck. You know, if you didn't book within a week, uh, or if you waited until that last week, you were you were not getting a room. Uh, you'd be you'd be out of luck. So it's it's great to see that uh, it's a little more accessible this year. Some of the aisles don't seem as is crammed. You're not walking shoulder to shoulder, but still, uh, I think there's a lot of people like uh, us that are waiting for the information to come through these live streams. And in fact, today's the day, I mean, already across the press, uh, because I signed up as press, my email's just getting flooded with all this stuff. A lot of it's irrelevant to what we're, we're uh, in our, our field, but uh, it's interesting to see how many new announcements there are. Yeah, interesting points about the attendance. I think the community really feels that they can get uh, you know, an idea about what's on the floor by folks like us that are reporting off of it and taking uh, taking their interest to it. So uh, definitely exciting, though. No lack of, of interest that way. Courtney? Yeah, NAB has certainly evolved over the 43 years that I've been attending. When uh, I first started going and first started uh, exhibiting, uh, it was mainly, it was National Association of Broadcasters. So the main people that attended it were television stations and broadcasters, professional broadcasters. So NBC, CBS, ABC, the networks. 
And this is where the major manufacturers of hardware like uh, professional video cameras and transmission equipment, uh, television transmission equipment, networking equipment. This is long before there was an internet, you remember. And everyone wore a suit at NAB. You would not be caught dead on the floor if you weren't wearing, uh, you know, a tie, a suit and tie. Um, And uh, it has changed with the democratization of video production where the cost of entry into pretty high-end video production has dropped dramatically. Uh, You've seen the the convention diversify a great, great deal more. And now the dress code has dropped, and you now can go, and I've seen people in cargo shorts and uh, Hawaiian shirts. So uh, (laughs) you'll see those. And uh, it, it was in the early years, you were no stranger to be able to see, because this is where the big deals were made with the networks, because a network would come in, and look at Sony's new cameras and say, and order, you know, $150 million worth of equipment to outfits their O and O stations. So big, big deals were made. So you'd always see the top executives at the hardware companies attending this show because it was where they made the majority of their sales for the year. You can still see, and the smaller booths, especially the new entrepreneurs that are showing stuff for the first time. You'll always see the the owner or the you can even even find the guy who wrote the software, you know, which you would never find anywhere online uh, have any access to those people. But a lot of times you'll see them there because they've got to get that prototype and keep it running at the show. So they'll be there to make sure nothing crashes and they have the latest build of the software, which was probably done the night before in their hotel room. So that's that's the situation there is now. So it's a great place to contact people, uh, especially the people behind the scenes and the technicians who really know the stuff a lot more than the marketers. Yeah, I think that first um, interview we had with uh, Lindsay Optics really was well demonstrated that, you know, I think it started off kind of a little bit slow, but then after they figured out all the different things they could show us and and uh, it it, uh, really picked up. Next question. Peter Belvin in Houston, Texas asks, if people have questions they'd like presented to a manufacturer, where can those questions be registered? Well, Peter, um, if we're covering it on the show floor, I know of a place, ask office, actually, no, uh, I was corrected. So we have another live code uh, that you can enter for the, um, I don't want to mess it up. So I'll let you, I'll let you wait for our productions coming up at uh, 12 Pacific. But um, uh, we can we can ask them, uh, f- you know, on the show floor if you catch it. Um, and if you go on to the special QR code for our coverage, you'll see that it's segmented. Uh, so you can actually put in questions for specific uh, parts that we have for our schedule. So check it out there. Next question. Next one is from me. Is small rig at NAB and has anyone seen anything new and interesting from them? Good running. Uh, I haven't seen any interesting stuff from them. Uh, they have the usual small stuff: the new cages, new uh, uh, connectors, and new gadgets, and nothing big. They have a, I think they have an updated uh, tripod head uh, for their existing tripod. They had some small stuff like uh, mid spreader, etc. And um, and uh, you asked also if they are in the booth, and yes, they are. Um, if you go to uh, past the stairs. So uh, the booth for uh, office hours is um, actually down with the stairs. And as you can see, uh, there is just a walk from uh, the office hours booth up to uh, along this, past the big uh, hallway. And then there is a small rig uh, before you enter the next uh, hall. So it's just a small walk. Maybe we should have... uh, have the guys uh, on the floor visiting them and check if they have something new. That would be cool. I remember when we did, we've come a long way. When we originally did our first NAB coverage um, a few years ago, we asked a poll of where everyone wanted to go. And we had small rig as one of our, it was the top, it was one of the top things that we had. And then we looked around and we figured, ah, they actually don't have a booth. They're actually partnering with some of the other ones. So I'm glad there is actually a, a booth that you can visit for some. Go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, they always do adaptations of their rigs and camera cages for new cameras that come out. And I don't know if they have access to uh, preliminary information before the NAB show announcements, but I wonder if they're going to be having uh, new rigs specifically for the Blackmagic Pixis line uh, and Cinema line. Uh, so those, those are two brand new cameras. They're probably going to be pretty popular because of their low prices. Uh, so a good opportunity for small rig to come out with some new designs. I haven't seen them yet, but if we get to their booth, we can ask them if they're going to be supporting those new camera platforms. Next question. Next one's from Brian Bovito in Detroit, Michigan. Guy, have you considered having an inexpensive machine on-prem to remote into via Splashtop, et cetera, that would use less bandwidth? Okay. I would love a machine on site if we only had the money to do that. Maybe go to officehours.com slash donate so we can put a machine there next year so that we can run Splashtop. I actually have a Splashtop account, so I'd, I'd be more than happy to use my account to put on that machine, uh, but also to have NDI or Ronnie's holding up a B-Link by not Courtney, because Courtney now recommends something else. Melee? Maybe maybe a Melee would be able to handle it if it had a, a, gra a graphics card. So, But yeah, that, that would definitely reduce the latency to, be, ha to have it on-prem. But the, the way that we're doing it right now, the picture quality is amazing. So I, I work with Jonas on another production where uh, we use this WEP um, um, multi-view, and it's gorgeous. Like, it, it's, it's, I have to ramp up the CPU. So I think Jonas is probably out of his own pocket uh, to run these web. So it might just be he chose a smaller instance in AWS to run that multi-view. So it, it just depends on how it's all routed. And again, we're a bunch of volunteers, ragtag crew, even though we're able to borrow some really nice cameras, yeah, we're still missing some infrastructure to make it to where, you know, it's, it's uh, as robust as we need to be able to have uh, all the pieces of the puzzle. But that's why we're doing this. I mean, we're we're running the ball down the field and yeah, I might I might get, uh, you know, blindsided by some big dude, but, uh, you know, at least we we gain some yards. So hopefully we just don't give any back. <laughs> All of the football analogies. Let's go to our next question. Next one is from Robert Sabavity in Poland. Zoom has been very busy and announced new releases at NAB. Any favorites yet? Courtney? Well, I've never been a fan of the H series, but they did uh, introduce some lower priced uh, entry level uh, H1 Essential and the H4 Essential, which is the H1 Essential, I think, is a two input handheld recorder with two built in microphones. And let's see, take a look at it here. And the H4 Essential, uh, which is 200 bucks and it gives you, you know, XLR inputs and uh, four channels of recording. I'm not sure if the, the clip-on micro, you can add two more channels uh, of XLR, I think, by replacing these top two microphones with two additional inputs. And for $200, I think they do 32-bit float. Uh, so uh, basically, it's a lower cost entry level to the H4 series line. So that's the essential line. So it, it lets you get in. I don't know of any... They had that... Uh, stomp pedal uh for guitarist which seems to be new too which is the ms70 cdr uh multi-stomp uh for a guitar you know for your guitar enthusiast to do uh, modeling and affect your guitar sound before it hits the amp and kai and just in case he's asking about Zoom, but the one that's sponsoring and footing the bill for our booth for the bandwidth, uh, Zoom uh, has a, have a few more announcements. The ones that I'm excited about are um, the Pro AV, which they did show at Zoom Topia, the hardware. So I'm interested in seeing how all this flows uh, once it's a shipping product. If it's, do I buy my hardware or is it something that Zoom's selling the hardware? Uh, I want to be able to utilize Zoom Rooms for production, which we do. I mean, every couple of weeks I have a production that I work on that we have to utilize Zoom rooms in the in the cloud and we use it very effectively. I mean if you guys saw what we do, it's it's pretty darn amazing. So we're we're basically just pulling Zoom rooms uh from a state similar to what we do here in, in office hours with with this show pull it, but we're doing it all in the cloud with VMix and Splashtop. Uh so I'm excited to see what new things that we can do with these new announcements. Uh the other one was uh Zoom tiles. Uh, and as Ronnie had said there's a uh, um, 
uh, the SDK for Unreal Engine. So some of the things we're actually showing on the floor tiles. Uh, so th this announcement's going out today. I don't know if it's already hit outside, but uh, Alex did just put a link in the Discord to sign up for the betas. So if you haven't already, uh, check your Discord and hit that link and sign up so that you can be made aware when these betas uh, start to become available for the rest of us. And Courtney? Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, if we were talking about Zoom Audio and not Zoom, the uh, communications device, which we're using now, they did release a brand new, uh, the new the new essential recorders that I spoke of earlier have uh, uh, things for the visually impaired and blind to use. So they have voice menus built into them. So their uh, accessibility features have been added to those essential items so that if you're uh, visually impaired or blind, uh, it's easy for you to operate the controls so the things that appear on the screen are now verbally announced in the headphones to you. So uh, that's a, a big improvement uh, to expand their product line. Next question. Next one's from Dave Troutman in, in Edmonton, Canada. Are we finally seeing the original dream of bringing the Office Hours community into the NAB show floor? I think we uh, are, especially with the the rig that we've been teasing it. Um, Alex has been building out his uh, his rig to be able to pull things around, um, and I think it's just a matter of fine tuning. Uh, I think we're we're already there. Uh, what do you think, Guy? I think so. We're getting we're getting closer as I was saying with the football analogy. We're moving the ball down the field. Uh, today, I just saw Alex. Um, uh, because I have this behind the scenes view, uh, he had a bunch of live view backpacks on the table. So that's an important part of this whole thing. And yesterday we didn't have it working correctly. So I'm guessing because all those live views were on the table that we're going to get that dream pushed a little bit further down the field uh, by having multiple ways of hopping around. So because we're using a VisLink in Central Hall, we're limited to the radius that we can transmit from the booth, which was just amazing. Like if you guys saw, so that multi-viewer that I was talking about, it was crisp. Like, I mean, it, it looked amazing. So the FX six through that viz link going into, um, the constellation is, is beautiful video. I mean, it's, it's really broadcast. When we say broadcast quality, I mean, it could be on a news station. It, it, it looks uh, jaw dropping. Um, so now we can go to South Hall, we can go to West Hall and uh, transmit with the live view. So that's bringing the community closer, especially since you guys uh, that are watching can go ahead and tell us where you want us to go. So I think that's pulling the community in to say, hey, we brought all the gear. And then that's the other part. I mean, seeing these guys behind the scenes, uh, you know, we've got Bill who's on camera, but the guys behind the scenes, Greg, Craig's a huge dude, man. That guy's a monster. I see him on screen. He makes Bill look small and Bill's a big dude. Uh, but yeah, bringing the community together to run camera. I see, uh, I think it said Wardo uh, run the FX6. Uh, there's a couple of people that, you know, we're learning their talents. And to me, it's how do you work under pressure? Because yeah, yesterday when the live views went down, we had to shift. I mean, uh, Grant did a great job. Brian did a great job. The, our whole run of show just went out the window. I mean, Courtney, the guys on the Ronnie, we all just danced, you know? So to me, that's part of the community is seeing how others work under pressure. And, you know, minutes before the show, we didn't know what was going to happen. So it's it's just how do you, how do you react and... Uh, uh, do I want to work with this guy in the future? Because, you know, he fell apart, you know, it's just like, and that's part of what this is about, you know, like go ahead and, and put people under pressure in a, in a environment where it's, uh, it's okay to fail. And so, uh, but you learn, you know, like the NDI thing we talked about, can we get NDI bridge on a local machine? Brian Bravito, part of the community says, Hey, this, this is how we do it. Why don't you do it this way? It's like, well, we need a $2,000 computer. Like if we had a $2,000, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. But that's part of the community building and we're doing this without a huge budget. It. So uh, it is what it is. And uh, hopefully people can just keep asking great questions to lead us around and we get more sponsors as well. Because I saw that our video got 3,000 views. Uh, I, w I went and took a nap yesterday after and <laughs> I went to sleep. It was 1,000 thousand views. And then I woke up and it was 3,000 views. So that's a lot of people to watch. I think we're, we're, making, we're making progress. We're definitely getting some attention. And if people can hashtag... Uh, NAB on X uh, and put a link to our feed, that would be helpful, especially with the manufacturers names as we go to those booths. That's again, part of being part of the community. If you want to do a small part, just send out a tweet. Yeah, I've seen a lot of um, people have some, you know, quick turnarounds and some, uh, you know, VODs and things. But as far as, you know, actually being there and 
taking you to the show floor. Yeah, I think uh, I think our coverage is where it's at. Uh, Ronnie. Yeah, I mean, are, are we seeing the dream of bringing the community into the the show floor? And um, I mean, we absolutely are. I mean, if you look at YouTube, it's it's four thousand views now, but you know, like w- this is this is the live panel interacting with somebody standing on the show floor, and that I mean, yes, the answer is yes. Are we seeing the dream of bringing the community to the show floor? It's it's right here. It's happening. And and it's it's very cool, Courtney. Yeah, you know, one thing we haven't, uh, you know, NAB does their own broadcast daily from uh, their theater. They have a theater that they've kind of taken over the east end of the central hall, which used to be where the audio stuff used to be, um, and they've made it their live theater. So they're they're broadcasting a competing live stream from there from ten thirty to six p.m. But I thought, and they they have. But they're, I don't think they're covering it by having uh, roaming uh, uh, people, interviewing people in their booths. They have people from the booths come in and be interviewed in their live set there. At NAB, I was thinking maybe we could get Alex booked on that show so we could cross-promote our live in-booth coverage and uh, you know get a little scoop on them. Um, but also, if you know, there is that live stream that after we're done at three o'clock or whenever our live coverage occurs each day, you can still tune over there and maybe find some interesting stuff that we haven't seen or covered yet at NAB that we could put into uh, our list, our rundown to be able to actually go to the booth and talk to these people for any new products that you may discover from the NAB live broadcast. Excellent. So we could almost get like an inception. Uh, coverage there. Yeah, interesting. We'll have to say a little behind the behind the shoulder cam. Next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois asks, regarding NAB, is on-site attendance post-pandemic increasing again from 2021 to 2024? I think Guy mentioned uh, a few of the, the stats around that. Uh, Guy? Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up here. I do have uh, some numbers that say uh, NAB announced preliminary registered attendance of uh, 65,000 for 2023. So this year, I think it was about the same. And then previous to that, it was a 20% increase over the headcount of 52,000 of 2022. And then we didn't have one in 2021. So uh, I think we are coming, we're coming back. At, but I think that because so many people you know, got used to Zoom and they're we're just getting better at at doing this kind of stuff that a lot of people did say, hey, I can just get all that information online. But there is nothing like the camaraderie. I do miss as I see these pictures of hanging out with Preto and, you know, it's it's cool to be there, as Bill would say, to get the camaraderie with the with the gang and get to hang out and see people. And uh, that's that's a big part of the show is is being able to do that is hang out with your mates. Yeah, I agree. I, it's it's kind of a um, two tugging interest. On the one hand, um, the equipment and the production of any you know the NAB um, really displays has never been more accessible. So for more interest of people looking at it, but I think guys right and what he's saying is that um, while people are, I think the interest around it is growing and it's more accessible to a wider audience. I think um, they recognize that they can get it uh, without necessarily having to be you know, right on site. Next question. Next one's from Daniel Patridge in Rochester, Minnesota. Roland seems to be absent from the show this year. Alexander? Yeah, you know, I like a lot of Roland products, but they seem to move very, very slowly with hardware upgrades. So I think some of their smaller switchers are due for an upgrade, certainly. Uh, the last thing that I saw that was notable was back in January where they announced a major new 3.0 firmware update for a lot of their their higher-end video switchers. So it's not like they don't do software updates. They absolutely do, but they're not like Blackmagic. They are, um, you know, they take their time releasing um, uh, releasing their hardware, and they're at a totally different price point too. So I'm not sure what they're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Courtney? Yeah, Roland uh, is a, a fairly big player in the musical mar- music market, so they usually blow their money on NAM, which just happened recently. And so maybe if they didn't have any new video products to show, 
it's awfully expensive to do NAB and they're kind of in a smaller market for NAB and they're competing against all these big hardware manufacturers are kind of lost in that convention. So I think they blow all their money up. Fantastic. Well, really appreciate uh, the show today. Some of our NAB participants, as well as uh, our, our folks and crew around there, we really appreciate um, all the panelists that came out uh, to do the show. Uh, also, all of our producers for your excellent questions. Uh, we have a great treat for you. So feel, uh, please feel free to continue to supply us with questions. That's what runs the show. Also, our back end crew, um, we uh, we pick up the ball um, every day and take it down the field. We see we just can't get away from the, the American football uh, you know, <laughs> illustrations there. We have a fantastic week of covering NAB for our daily show, focusing on each, each of the different verticals, as well as our unique coverage. We have three more days. Our next coverage will start at 12 p.m. Pacific time. I'll see you in after hours. Wearing my comfortable flip flops here in my lazy boy at home. Can't say I don't miss having to eat that gross trade show food. I would always walk over to the Renaissance and go get a real burger over at the at the nice hotel. Give me your steak. Meetings. Yeah, right. At IBC in Amsterdam, we had really good uh, catering. It was amazing this year or last year. Yeah. Food at NAB is like a $35 hamburger. It's been pre cooked somewhere off the site and brought in in a warming tray <laughs> and reheated. At IBC, we even have uh, our own barista making this really amazing coffee.